Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, what's my show called? Chit Chats with Git Cats, number 36. I know that because I've got it written right down here. And today I've got a really cool guest. Tonight in my part of the world, today in his part of the world, because it's very early morning, and uh, ding dong, who is at my door? None other than a Stefan Kumara from Obscura. Hey, Stefan, how you doing, man? Hey, good morning, and hello to Down Under. How are you yes, doing? Yes, yeah, good evening for me, and it's a, a, a good morning to you. You're in, you're in Germany, yeah? I'm in Germany, close to Munich. Oh, cool. If you know Oktoberfest and all those cliches, that's exactly where I'm from. That's where you are. Yeah, cool. Cool, man. I was in Germany last year, actually. Um, don't ask me where. Uh, there's a YouTuber in Germany named Henning Pauli. I don't know if you know Henning. Uh, he had a, a cool little event called 42 Gear Street, and I went to that last September, I think. And, man, I loved it. I loved the all journey. Right. That's yeah, yeah. Great. But uh, uh, I don't know the YouTube. Uh, HP forty two. He calls himself. Um, you'd know it. if you saw his, his channel. You'd recognize the big wall of amps and everything that he has. He's he's a quirky little bald man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds <Yeah>. quite German. <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. But but Stefan um, Obscura, man, I I hadn't heard of you guys, but. Um, my friends over at um, at Angle put me onto you guys, and uh, you've been you've been playing their gear for a while. I take it, and I had a listen, and I just went, "Fuck me, listen to that! That is awesome! That is so cool!" Uh, and I should check out some more of that. What got you started in this crazy world of the guitar, man? How did you start playing guitar? Um, actually, I played uh, a piano a couple of years before. And yep. I figured uh, playing death metal with a piano on stage doesn't work at all. So I figured I had to buy a guitar somehow, somewhen. And uh, at the age of 16, I got a quite cheap uh, Jackson guitar. Yeah. For around 300 bucks, 400 bucks, like a, a used guitar. It wasn't the best, but uh, it was a start. And uh, when I updated the guitar with uh, EMG 81, classic uh, heavy pickup with a lot of distortion, a lot of a lot of output. Um, it, it was the, let, let's call it the proper start for that. And since then, it's, it's always a, it has been a journey and uh, my sound changed over the, over the years. I figured what I want to do with the sound, I figured uh, what kind of gear I want to play. And as you mentioned, Engel, I'm playing Engel since 2009. So we have our 11th uh, anniversary this year and I can't be happier with that. And for guitars, I play so much different stuff these days, and from ESPs uh, to yeah, a couple of different acoustic guitars. So for the music we play with Obscura, also it's kind of heavy and quite extreme. We need quite diverse equipment since the uh, the palette of colors what we're doing musically is so wide and, and spread uh, from very silent parts to a very very uh, thick arrangements, so to say, with a lot of well, a lot of uh, used frequencies. Let's call it like that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So what got you into such heavy music, man? You said you started out on piano and there was no way you're going to be playing death metal on piano. How did you first encounter death metal? Or is that something that's just really big over in Germany? Uh, I wouldn't say death metal was uh, quite big at the time in Germany. So... Um, as I mentioned, I played piano in the very first place. I um, I got a scholarship for uh, yeah a boarding school for a couple of years for musically gifted kids, and uh, there you only played classic music like Bach, Mozart, and all of those uh, let let's call it hits from back in the days. Uh-huh. And uh, as a as a teenager, you somehow tend to uh, yeah fight against whatever is told you what to do Absolutely. in your life and yeah. uh so, somehow with all my friends it was kind of naturally uh, to turn into a heavy metal from rock into heavy metal and uh, i started with bigger death metallica all that but the fun fact comes here we have a very well sorted library in our in our hometown mm -hmm. 
And in the library, we had Slayer, we had Cannibal Corpse and a couple of other death metal and even black metal bands. And somehow it turned me on because it was so out of the world. Um, and I, I, had to, I had to listen to that. And at first I didn't like it, but uh, somehow it was uh, fascinating over, over the weeks and months. And the same happened to all, all my friends. And at the same time, uh, let's call it uh, a small scene was born over, over a couple of months and everybody was listening to extreme music. And we, we tried to find even more extreme music. And back then, internet wasn't that thing. It was there, but well, not in every household. So uh, we, we tried to get the most extreme music and it was like a, well, like a, like a hit and run uh, to get the most brutal sound. And uh, that actually still, still is the case. I love that kind of music and I listened to what I was listening to back in the days, like in 20 years ago. And uh, these days I still figure there, there are new bands who bring it even further and it's it's just the, the way uh the music i like i enjoy wow wow and to think um that you found it at the library that that is so cool <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> german libraries are killing <laughs> yeah right yeah uh, and you're right about rebelling a lot of people get into things because it's a rebellion against well you said classical music have you found that anything that you learned from classical music carries over into playing progressive death metal? Actually, yeah, a lot. Yeah? Actually, a lot. I mean, the biggest gift I, I got from that school back in the days was uh, training your ear. Mm -hmm. So you were to analyze what, uh, what tone is correct and which one is out of pitch, out of tune. That helps. It doesn't matter what kind of music you play. But um, comparing classical music to, to death metal or what we play is uh, not too far from away from each other. Especially um, if you analyze the harmonics, if you analyze uh, rhythmic patterns, I would even say within rhythmic patterns, some of the music we are playing when it comes to um, polyrhythms is um, not out of the box, I would say even more advanced than most of the classic classic music from 17th, 18th, 19th century. Like uh, some of the newer com uh, composers, they start to work with that. Like Stravinsky did some uh, fantastic work with uh, a piece written for metronomes, for example. And uh, some somehow uh, the ways are crossing at that point. I w Back in the 60s, 70s, or when heavy metal was really, really big in the 80s and 90s, People thought heavy metal is only noise, it's only, it's only crap, it's uh, just a bunch of, uh, well, weird people, drug addicts, uh, trying to play music, but um, if, if you go really deep into the music, it's not. It's not. Of course, there, there are bands that only play like two chords, maybe even wrong, <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, there, there are even really, really, really advanced musicians playing very advanced music and uh, within that tiny tiny little scene uh, that was built within the progressive and technical death metal scene it's really really important to know what you're doing on your instrument not only from the technical side but also from how to understand what uh, kind of music you're composing and playing live also the scene is small there's the scene present somewhere in the world well, man, yeah, like it is really obvious uh, checking out some of your stuff that that you guys can play. There is no way you'd be able to pull off that kind of music without having incredible musicianship behind you. So I was wondering where where you got that, but it all sort of makes sense now that uh, it came from going to um, a music school for, for gifted children, and uh, and it carries on from there. <laughs> and and even you know, just like all the the, the some of the solos with all your, your sweep sweep arpeggios and things, you know, that, that all sort of goes back to classical violin lines and things, doesn't it? Uh, it does. But I have to admit that uh, I'm, I'm a more the rhythm guitar player. I okay. do some solos, I do some leads. I yeah. play uh, or I, I write uh, a lot. Of, but the other musicians in the band, they have been uh, studying at the conservatory, they've been uh, studying at music schools, at uh, universities, different styles, from pop music 
to uh, jazz music. The last guitarist was uh, at the um, Hoche School uh, from Amsterdam, a uh, con conservatory. And they bring their uh, background into what we are doing with the band. And uh, talking about the, the leads you mentioned, of course, this is based somewhere in, in this area, in uh, the area of uh, music theory to the max. Wow. So when it comes to writing this stuff, do you guys write together or do you write all the songs yourself? How does that go down? Mm, that changed over the, over the years. What we figured is uh, the fact that this kind of music is not made for jamming in the rehearsal room. So unfortunately, unfortunately, when we started playing music, everything was, of course, um, on, a, on a lower level. When we started playing um, in a band, every, every, everybody starts somewhere. And with Obscura, uh, we haven't been on the level we are now. And everything was a little bit easier. When we picked up to get more and more technical and the arrangements got um, more layered, we figured we have to write it down. We have to write every note down. And yeah. um, I think around a decade ago, like 2008, we started to work with a program called uh, Guitar Pro. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, it's a notation uh, program. The, the very first versions have been quite quite basic, but they work. And uh, nowadays there are a thousand of different different other functions for layouting sheet music and all that. But this helped us uh, to write down all the ideas and work on details, work on arpeggios, work on um, how to stick parts together um, on several several bridge versions and all all those poly rhythms. You cannot um, jam out poly rhythms like out of out of your pocket. That's mm. uh, simply not working. And this program, in return, helped us to write even more advanced music. I, I was going to say, um, how the hell do you remember all this stuff when you're writing? But it makes sense that you'd use something like, like Guitar Pro. Uh, funnily enough, just in the comments section, I can see that we have someone called The Guitar Pro watching, which is uh, my friend Ryan. So, hey, Ryan, thanks for watching, mate. Um, yeah, quite ironic. And somebody's trying to call me. I'm just going to turn that off. Um, so using this, this program, how does that work? I'm not, not familiar with it. Um, does it give you tab? Can you guys all read music? Uh, how do you go about reading it? Uh, you, you have the option to either, uh, watch the classic sheet music or tablet and both works, both works vice versa. Okay. Um, what makes it super easy uh, is uh, everything is MIDI based. So whenever you, you write down your, your ideas, you can add uh, basic drum lines and uh, export it to like a, a normal MIDI file and import it to your DAW. We work with Cubase, which means you have a complete template of a song. And you write it in Guitar Pro, you export it, transfer it to uh, Cubase or uh, whatever Avid unit you use or Ableton Live. And uh, with that, you have a very good impression how the, the music will sound in the end. That is awesome. The very first. Yeah, that's super easy. It's a, it's a fantastic tool. But uh, as with every tool, this one also has its, uh, well, not so good approach uh, when you start working with it. What happened? Ten years ago, uh, we started with uh, only writing music on Guitar Pro. So... When we first started with this program, we first had the songs written on guitar, started to, well, more or less keep all the ideas, as you mentioned. You, you somehow have to remember all, all what we do. Hmm. And so we transferred our ideas, we wrote on the guitar to Guitar Pro. And then, well, we rehearsed it, we, we made a small pre-production. That was fine. The album after, we been on tour a lot, so we had to write all of this music only on the computer. Without an instrument in your in your hand, like oh, a, wow. some yeah, you you write guitar with without a guitar in your hand, uh, in your hand, and that was uh, a big mistake because the computer can play everything. <laughs> when when we went into the studio, we figured, oh, <laughs> how do we play <laughs> this, this? This ain't gonna work. Yeah, exactly, and that uh, turned out in in, a, in an album with uh, six to eight rhythm guitars. Um, with, well, 
courts you you're not uh, like a real human is not able to uh, uh, to play, so we had to rearrange everything in the studio, which turned out into a big mess. And nowadays, um, we try to uh, pick up the best things of both worlds. So what we're going to do is first write raw tracks with your guitar, record everything, then we write out everything in uh, Guitar Pro. So we basically um, transfer the, the raw ideas into into sheet music and there we have the basic of a song and then we start uh, working out all the details and that helps you to well keep songs more or less playable but at the same time add the spice uh, and uh, the real details and the deep 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 um, I call it nerd ideas um, like the polyrhythms and all that uh, and still keep it playable so in my opinion, we found uh, a, a way to work with uh, both worlds, like the improvisation with your guitar, which is, I, for me personally uh, is the most fun part. Just having a guitar in your hand and play a couple of riffs uh, and then more or less you, you get to feel um, what works and what could be transferred into a song. But at the same time, you have the option to, to adjust like tiny little parts when you have uh, everything transferred into sheet music. And that's uh, the way also we, uh, we wrote the last two records and we're still uh, working on a new album at the moment, which is not finished yet. But uh, this is the way we're working now. And if you, if you compare it to quite demanding music, we play with uh, the, uh, the finished records in the end. I think you can figure this is, this is working out. <laughs> yeah, wow. Man, I've, I've never heard of doing it that way, but it, it absolutely makes sense. So it's almost like you're demoing the songs before you've even played them yeah mm-hmm. but just using midi so midi drums yeah do the midi guitars sound decent enough in, in guitar like pro it. yeah <laughs> yeah no 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 <laughs> they absolutely, said. Not. absolutely not yeah um it's yeah uh, you get a feel for it how it may sound in the end yep. if you if you know your own guitar sound and uh, you have a wish in how it will sound or should sound on the record um it's okay, but uh, the, the the guitar sounds uh, within Guitar Pro or any other um, notation software don't don't take it serious. Okay, okay. it's just <laughs> just it gives you it. just to get the ideas down and everything. Now, one thing that's really different that st- that stood out to me when I listened to uh, your music was the use of, firstly. It's a fretless bass, which I normally wouldn't associate with uh, with death metal. But then on the clips when I saw it, it was like, how many strings is on that fucking thing? Is it like seven, eight string? What, what's the bass player using there, man? Um, regularly a six string fretless bass. Uh, but now, of course, more is more. A wise man once said, um, seven strings. And how the hell is that it's, tuned? Um, it changed our entire sound for the band, and at the same time, it also d- defined a little bit our own niche of music. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, no one would ever, well, add a, a fretless bass to like this heavy music, and this is this is quite, I would say, creative at the same time stupid, because um, the fretless bass it's fretless; it's never one hundred percent in pitch. Of course, you can adjust it uh, in, a, uh, in a production during the production process, but um, it's all always uh, close to the in, uh, exact intonation. But since you're, uh, we are talking about the bass guitar, which is based in a very very low uh, frequencies, it's not that it doesn't sound that wrong as, for example, a violin. When you play a violin a little bit, uh, a notch off, a couple of cents off. It sounds like uh, all your teeth are falling apart. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, with, with the bass guitar, we changed all arrangements of the band completely. So the rhythm guitars are actually a more rhythmic pattern than in most of the 90s or 80s production um, metal bands would approach. In the 80s or 90s, the bass guitar, for whatever reason, turned out to mostly play root notes to add a little bit more spice to the drums. What we did is uh, changing this completely. So the bass guitar is uh, 
on equal use as uh, the rhythm guitars, which means also the bass guitar always has to shine through. For example, if you um, have a more uh, dynamic song with a couple of uh, smooth parts with uh, acoustic guitars, then you have this uh, fretless bass playing a, a lead a lead bass or a, a bass solo over it, and it gives you a completely, complete different feel. So that that's always a challenge, uh, writing music, because um, in this music we're playing, it's by name, it's called technical death metal, which means uh, the guitars usually are super fast. You have like uh, eight note picking, which is a very, very thick if you just see the, the fundament. And the bass guitar is somehow, let's call it noodling around in the, in the lower frequencies. But um, to get all this in balance, it's quite demanding to write a, uh, a good piece of music. And at the same time, it shouldn't sound like noodling around. It should sound like a really, really um, special thing on top of a good uh, composition. And there are a lot of discussions within the band all day. And um, it's demanding, but at the same time, the overall sound is so special, you immediately could mention if you're a little bit known into the scene, uh, if, if you're aware of the scene and uh, all those bands, what they're playing, that uh, with adding the fretless bass, we found our own niche within all those bands. Absolutely. It's like with um, other good bands, for example, in Metallica, I would say James Hetfield, his voice makes the band sound like uh, this band does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if somebody else uh, sing over those songs, it might be close, but still... The vocals define the sound, and within our sound, uh, in in our world, I would say this fretless bass guitar is defining our overall sound the most. Absolutely. Well, that's it. Really jumped out at, to me. And one thing that I noticed about the fretless is it's a different frequency. Um, most metal bass to get it to cut through that it's got a lot of treble in there and a lot of upper mid range to, for it to be heard, which kind of fights with the guitars. But with that fretless bass, it sort of jumps out in the lower mids. It's got more of that all, all, all kind of frequencies about it. And so when your bass player does play cool lines, I'm noticing it does pop out a lot more and it's just an identifiable signature, signature sound, man. So hats off to you for, for coming up with something so unique. It's, it's great. Well, it was an idea. First of all, a stupid idea, but it turned into a signature sound, as you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we, we talked about the bass there. How about guitars? What what tuning do you guys tune to? Since we started the band, and uh, since I play guitar, I always play uh, in D standard, which yeah. means one full tone down. And with seven string guitars, it's then A standard. Okay, yep. Cool. So no, no, and, uh, no drop D style. So it's just like a standard tune down a whole step. Yes, that's what we do since eighteen years now. And uh, I wouldn't call that a signature, but uh, it makes things easier. We first started with only six string guitars, but during our second album, uh, we also had another experiment, and we had two completely different. Uh, tuned six string guitars. So the idea was having one six string guitar tuned to D standard playing against and like a counterpoint uh, idea to a six string guitar tuned to A standard and they fight with each other. The, the song is called Cosmogenesis, the title track from our second record. And the, the overall idea I would say turned out mediocre. But when we had to play this song live, we figured, ah, we have to bring a couple of other guitars with this to, uh, to the shows. So in, instead of uh, bringing more guitars, we just bought different guitars, but they turned out to be seven strings. And then this overall uh, experiment uh, with the two different tuned guitars turned the entire band into playing seven string guitars. That was around 10 years ago. So somehow it turned out uh, naturally to play those instruments. On the other hand, when I first played a seven string, I didn't like it at all. Up to this day, I, I prefer six strings because the, the necks are a little bit thinner and I'm not 20 anymore. Uh, seven string guitars are more heavy and, you know, 
<laughs> when you play two hours uh, uh, every night, your your back really hurts. When you do that thirty nights in a row, I bet, I bet. No one's younger. So, so you're just using seven string guitars now. Like, do you play those old songs written for six string? Do you still play those on the seven? Yep. Yes. You just, yes. Think, just on all live shows. It... You just ignore that that one string then. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it works in in most songs splendidly, but uh, a couple of songs we just don't play live. <laughs> That's the solution. <laughs> No, it's it's way easier. I don't like to switch guitars uh, doing live shows. Um, I barely uh, destroy any strings or um, have any problems on stage. But uh, changing guitars on stage, uh, I tried it just for like entertainment reasons. Playing a white guitar and then a blue guitar uh, might add something to to the stage production or the look, the visible part. But uh, I stopped doing that. I have one guitar I really love to play, and uh, it's simply the guitar I play every day. It's a, a seven-string arrow from ESP guitars. And if you if you have a certain feel on a guitar, it's hard to uh, take it over to another guitar. Also, it's the same brand. Also, it's um, more or less coming from uh, from the same uh, custom shop. It still feels different. Mm -hmm. And I have a problem with that since the material is so demanding if I play uh, um, a really, really, really technical song on stage I'm, and I'm singing along to that. I'm not thinking about playing guitar. I have to leave it like to the to the autopilot, I call it, yeah. and focus on working on the vocals. And uh, my, my third job on stage is being the entertainer. So I have three jobs and guitar playing is on on the autopilot mode. Yeah. And if I change guitars, it changes too much of the feel. It, if the guitar is only shifted a little bit, like two centimeters uh, due to the um, guitar strap I'm using, yep. it uh, fucks up my entire show. I bet, I bet. And uh, you said you're getting an, an EMG81 pickup in your first guitar, in the old Jackson. Um, are you still yeah. using the EMG81? No, not anymore. No? Since a couple of years, I no, not anymore. Um, the reason is simply that when we started playing this kind of music, it was all about the brutality, all about sounding the most, the most bizarre possible. And uh, of course, we put all gain settings and even the EQ settings to eleven. Yep. But it sounded like uh, you could imagine, um, <laughs> like crap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we uh, elaborated our entire sound within the band, uh, we started to play clean guitars, like a couple of effect guitars, and um, it turned out that uh, EMG81 is perfect for like thrash metal, death metal, uh, whatever more extreme music you're going to play. But as soon as you start with um, clean sounds, effect sounds, um, there's too much output, and the, the signal is too squared. For that, so I tried around a little bit, and uh, within the the arrow I'm playing right now, and also my other guitars, I, I switched pickups. I'm uh, I'm working with EMG 67 and I guess uh, 56. Okay. Let me see. So you you're still still st sticking uh, to, to EMG then, but just different models. Yes, yeah. I, I still work with EMG. I even had the chance to uh, visit the factory. In uh, in California a couple of years ago. Oh, cool! I visited NAMM show in 2018, and uh, uh, the, the guys uh, simply asked uh, if I want to visit the, the factory. So I flew up, and that was that was really interesting. I'm I'm an engineer, so I'm really interested in uh, everything that works around with gear, with technique, uh, with also the, the people behind it. And it was really um, one of one of the best times uh, talking to the people that are developing all those gear, all, all this gear, like the uh, EMGs. But uh, mentioning uh, Engel Amps, I also visited Engel Amps multiple times. They live, uh, the, the company is based two hours from my spot. Oh, cool. And I love simply to go down and, and try out their uh, new prototypes and even even the old 
uh, which means all like the, the established amplifiers they have in in their factory, and that's that's always cool to talk directly to the people instead of you know going the way through I don't know a music expo or something and talking to uh, a gear representatives instead of talking to the people who are developing the material and tell them this knob is stupid and but this here sounds fantastic. It's, it's way more direct. Absolutely, I, I, I like that about Perfect. Engel because uh, uh, it was it was actually Jürgen that, that introduced the two of us. Uh, so I know Jürgen and Martin, Martin, Marty. Um, what particular angle gear are you using now? Um, I changed over the years. Yeah. Um, I love I love rack equipment, like 19-inch rack gear. Yep. Because it makes my life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, I only use tube amplifiers for the sound on the, on the record, but also uh, green concerts. And uh, I work with a combination of uh, uh, 840-50 tube amplifier with a 530 preamp. It was my setup for the last 10 years. Nice. But um, if, as we changed the sound within the band a little bit, the two-channel preamp was uh, a little bit too limited. So um, I talked to the guys in Engel, and we, we discussed the entire topic. And they sent me two special edition preamps. And this has changed uh, the sound of the band completely. The problem is um, I also got uh, a Savage 120 Mark II amplifier last year just for testing purposes. And now <laughs> I'm a little bit in between in between the, the worlds uh, what I'm going to do for the next record. But those two, uh, those two um, amplifiers will will be my setup for the next uh, for the next album definitely but for live shows i'm absolutely uh, working only with uh, my rec gear so the special edition and the 84050 amplifier nice but um one or, one or two years ago uh, the guys in engel also introduced me to uh, a tiny little piece called a cap loader uh -huh. uh, i'm not sure if you're familiar with that uh i have one right ah, here oh yeah there's the one right here actually except Exactly. I have it there because I was actually writing a little demo to do of the cab loader. So this is the cab loader. If I hide my eyes, perhaps that will focus. There we go. <laughs> that Stefan is talking about. Ah, I didn't about. see you have that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And uh, with, with this cab loader, uh, I started to, to experiment a little bit back and forth. Since within Obscure, we, are, we work with uh, in-ear systems. Okay. The problem with the uh, simply to have a click track, play along, and um, I really hate uh, being rely uh, having to be relied on uh, local gear. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you're playing in some venues and uh, the, some speakers of the monitors are blown out, you really have a hard time, well, surviving on stage. Let's let's call it like that. So um, playing with the in ears helped a lot. But there's still room, have room to uh, optimize the entire setup. So what I did is uh, sitting down with the cap loader and trying to get rid of the problem that every time you set up your stage, you have a fantastic guitar sound. Um, your guitar is well, well in tune. But the only problem, the only variable that changes your sound is the position of the microphone. Mm -hmm. And usually, there's always the one guy on stage. It's mostly the bassist <laughs> like crushing into uh, the, micro the, the microphones of um, of the guitars and then you either hear nothing or just uh, a lot of noise so what i did is working with the cap loader i got four of the cap loaders i built them in between the preamp and the amplifier and uh, bypass the signal uh, from the um from the preamp into the cap loader, and the signal from the cap loader goes directly in our in ears. That means I combined the idea of having my tube signal from the preamp, but having avoided this problem with the mic microphone setting on the guitar cabinet while taking the signal from uh, the preamp into into the cap loader, which is uh, basically a well. Uh, a cap simulator into Imp my ears. Impulse response loader as well, isn't it? So it yeah. um, you can load your own 
impulse responses into there. You can, it's got their, their, theirs that they've put in there with, you can choose which microphone simulation you want to use. You can adjust the, the distance uh, and whereabouts on the, the uh, actual virtual speaker you are as well with the microphone. What, have, what power amp mm-hmm. you're using, that's a, there's a, a power amp simulation there as well. So it's got some really cool stuff. Um, I actually have got it there because I'm going to try playing. I've got a an ADA and a Marshall JMP1 rack preamp, and I was going to try and incorporate those two to make a little portable setup for myself um, and maybe just incorporate an effects unit, a multi-effects unit into that. Uh, speaking of multi-effects, mm-hmm. are you running many effects live as well with that? Um, yes and no. I have one unit. Uh, it's actually a quite old model. It's a TC Electronic G Major 2. Okay. If you're familiar with that one, it's a, it's a quite common um, effect unit. What I changed a little bit in using this effect unit is simply building our entire rack system, including the G Majors. So both amplifiers of both guitars are built in one entire big system. And since the multi effects board is, um, uh, it's first of all, it's, it's quite easy to use, but uh, we have so many sounds during our live settings. You, you cannot use any food pedals anymore. It's yeah. also a, one of those variables that can fuck up your entire show. So, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, I, I used the regular uh, food pedal. I switched on the pedal, and instead of using the solo channel, of course, I obviously stepped on the clean channel. <laughs> that <laughs> turned out into many loss, but also, well, uh, complaining a lot after the show within the band. So what I try to do is also finding a solution for this, I call it a problem. So what we do is uh, firing everything alongside our click track to the in-ears, um, MIDI signals. Mm-hmm. So we have one chain of uh, MIDI signals going to both of the uh, G major twos. They're changing all the program settings live through the show. So you don't have to step on any any pedals anymore. You just concentrate completely on, on your performance. And that helped so much. That helped so much. And this is also the reason why I'm not working with um, any outboard or, or classic analog uh, pedals. There are some pedals that sound way better. That's no 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 talk uh, no no question about that, but this solution we found it we found at the moment is simply more convenient, mm-hmm. and uh, you have less problems with the entire setup. And I'm I'm not finished with my entire uh, with my entire ideas for making the the sound a little bit. Yeah, I wouldn't call it better, but uh, the the entire handling more convenient for playing live, but also. Uh, eliminating all variables. Mm. So I want to get my tubes out, but at the same time, I want to have uh, the convenience of one of those modeling apps. And this is the quest for the holy grail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It makes sense, man, to be, if you're playing music that technical, you don't want to be tap dancing. So to be sending program change numbers. I was going to ask you early on whether you um, were using a, a click and um, – and you answered that along the way, and that's the most obvious thing to do is to have program change numbers being sent to your gear. That's why I was always a rack guy myself. The old ADA from back in the nineties, I was mm-hmm. using one of those purely because I I wasn't using MIDI program changes. Late nineties, I was, um, but earlier on the piece, I just had a standard controller. When I wanted to change to a lead sound, I didn't want to have to turn on this pedal, that pedal, that pedal. I just wanted to hit one button and have the whole lot change uh, and that took me down that road are you guys running tracks as well like any keyboard parts or anything like that um alongside you are yeah yep yes uh we have one uh, sequencer unit running all those um, backing tracks and uh, midi files alongside and on channel three the the, um, the click track for everyone that works perfectly we never had any dropouts during shows um, and it helps spicing up the, the live shows. We have a couple of arrangements with uh, acoustic guitars plus lead guitars. So during the songs or outros, intros, all of all of those um, great sounds that make a show a little bit more interesting. 
and uh, therefore we need the backing tracks. We do not um, have any any rhythm guitars on those tracks. It's just uh, the salt in the soup for yeah. live shows. Cool. But we need it definitely. But I have to say, I also play in another band, yeah, which is more raw, old school uh, black and death metal called uh, Tulkandra. And there we don't play with a click track. We don't play with backing tracks. We just play straight into the amps and therefore go for it. It's uh, the music that demands certain equipment, in my opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you said that you were using the cab loader, one of them, to, to get your in-ear sound. Are you feeding the front of house your, through a cab loader as well? So that you're not micing up your cabinets on stage? Yep. Um, we are still in the middle of uh, experimenting alongside. On the last tour we played uh, in February, March this year, um, I built in four of the cab loaders, since usually we mic uh, the guitar cabinets with two microphones each, like uh, different Sennheiser mics. And uh, we split the signals, like one guitar is on, sharp on the left, one sharp on the right, but since um, the listener who is in front of the stage, on the stage right, at that point only would listen to one guitarist, but they paid for two. So um, we cross a little bit um, the other microphones. So that helps a lot, like getting an overall sound, but still keeping the idea of having panned the guitarist left and right in the PA. And with the cap loaders, we simply add the signal on during the tour we tried both ways we uh, we mixed the the regular signal of the uh, microphones with the cab loader we tried only microphones and used the cab loader only for in ears but we also tried um, using the cab loader signal only for the PA but the first two or three rows that are straight on the on the stage they still hear the signal from uh, the guitar cabinets we crank up a little bit so. Yeah, there are pros and cons for, for everything. Uh, we are not finished in testing everything, but um, I enjoyed checking out nerd uh, gear. I'm a, I'm a gear nerd myself. Yeah. And um, as I mentioned, uh, there's, uh, there's always the quest for the perfect sound. Never ending. I'm not, I'm not sure what. No. Never and also, um, you have to think about it. The, the clubs itself, they, they differ. Sometimes you play a, a room with 400 uh, capacity. And, uh, of course, the rooms are way smaller and people hear more, uh, more the sound from the stage itself. If you play a stadium show, if you play on a big festival, absolutely no one will hear anything from your, from your cabinet on stage. And we, we still try to emulate uh, all settings and uh, get it a little bit more there where I think uh, the good sound could, uh, could reach out to. So the cap loader is a, a very nice tool, and uh, it's it's uh, well <laughs> interesting what you can do with all, uh, with uh, this little piece. I also use it for my uh, for my little uh, home amp. I have a, a 15 watt what's it called Gig Master, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm recording with the Gig Master straight in my DA DAW. So. The thing is a very, very nice tool I, I can use for multiple purposes and there are even more I, I didn't even try out yet. I know sure. you can uh, upload your own uh, pulls and responses, but I didn't use that function. Did you so far? No, I haven't yet. Um, I need to exp um, look into how to do that so that I can show people in the demo that I'm about to do for it. Um, but the models that are in it already um, are fantastic. And I think the whole speaker impulse response IR modeling really is the way to go now um there's been other technologies around for a while and it, it was uh, but i was talking to pete thorne yesterday don't know if you know youtuber pete thorne uh did a live interview with him and his um new signature app has uh built in irs and you can load your own and each channel you can assign a different imp impulse response depending on the sound that you're after and he said he ran some tests where he was a being and cutting between the, a real mic cabinet and the the speaker impulse response, and he said it was just you could not hear the difference, undetectable. Uh, and uh, 
there was another guest, Bob Spencer from Roast Tattoo, that was a guest on here uh, a month or so ago, and he, he sent me his album to listen to. And the first thing was the guitar sound at the beginning. I, I texted him and just went, fuck me, man, listen to that. I can touch that sound. It's just, I got some NS10s here, and it's, it's like, man, I can could, I could almost touch the sound coming out of the speaker. Uh, and I was very surprised when he said it was all into a load box, then run through speaker IRs. Um, Steve Stevens, I had him on recently uh, from Billy Idol Band, and he said the same thing. He's using the uh, Boss Tube Amp Expander, gave that a shot. And as soon as he tried that at Soundcheck, his sound guy came running down the front just going, man, you got to hear this. And as you said, the consistency of not having the bass player knock over the mic. Uh, or, <laughs> and I've had that over the years, man, where you know, sometimes the sound guy just isn't paying attention. And the people, your friends in the crowd would go, man, from about halfway in, I just couldn't hear you. And then you look over and there's the mic on your cab. It's been knocked over. Uh, you say the bass player, I find it's always singers with their mic stands. They always go on and put their mic stand <laughs> right in front of your gear and knock it over. But you are the singer, so it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> well said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can do what you want. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So um, speaking of, of yeah. touring, have you um, have you been to Australia? Have you toured Australia? Yes, we did. Yeah, uh, We did a small run. Uh, in uh, Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne, and then uh, hopping over to New Zealand. That was brutal. <laughs> 20, 27 hours uh, uh, one way traveling. That uh, really knocked me out. <laughs> but I loved it. I loved it. Uh, of course, we uh, we visited a, a, a koala reservoir in Brisbane. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we spent all of our um, per diems on the first day in a strip club so everything done right <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it yeah no actually I um, I think it's Ryan that I saw was watch, was watching in the comments there uh, said that maybe his old band played with you guys or something I'm not sure what the name of his band was uh, hang, we just dropped a message now last year with Alarum my old band it was amazing yeah Cool. Yes, I uh, I love Alarum. It's um, quite I wouldn't call them old, but uh, uh, an established band from Australia, mm -hmm. playing more or less the same style as we do. A little bit more jazzy, more more fusion influenced, but uh, killer killer band. Great guys to hang out with and super guitar nerds. <laughs> <laughs> when you have a chance, check it out. Check it out. They're a little bit less extreme than us, but killer guitar playing killer guitar playing and uh, I wanted this band so bad we tried to uh, play shows in Europe years ago I think even 10 years ago or longer and uh, when we got the chance to play Australia and New Zealand I wanted uh, to finally uh, well <laughs> uh, I call it uh, finish the cycle and invite the guys and it's, uh, it turned out really really well killer band as you say it is a, a brutal trip to go that way I, as I said I went to Germany last year and by the time I got there man oh, uh, I thought it would be smart to have a really long stopover oh, eight hours or something in, in Singapore along the way and try and get some sleep there but yeah. didn't happen didn't happen and by the time I got there man so must have been hard especially as a singer do you find it hard especially with the style of singing that you do trying to not trying to keep your voice fit, I guess, because, um, okay, so I was at a friend's place this afternoon um, who is a very established session musician, Louis Shelton. He played back from the Monkees and the Jackson 5 and Boz Skaggs and all, oh, this, wow. all this cool stuff, right? Um, and I, I, I did a little something on his computer for him and I, um, I played him some of your music. And he was just like, whoa, there's some musicianship there. And, and I said to him, man, these guys are the athletes, like the drummer. Imagine trying to play that mm -hmm. the whole time, how fit you'd have to be to keep that up. And I think all of you guys, like technically just the, the right hand on, on the – all the time uh, for the guitarists. Um, and then you're, you're singing as well with the the Satan, bringing the Satan. <laughs> <laughs> How yeah, do you is that is that a challenge to stay 
fit on the road? Like you, you said about going to, to the strip bars and stuff, but do you find that you actually have to have a decent lifestyle to maintain in order to be able to, to perform this kind of music? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, as, as a guitarist or bassist, I think you have the easiest life because you're not that um, reliable. You don't rely that much on your body. Of course, when uh, when you have a hard time, maybe you play a wrong chord when you're not uh, completely awake. Um, you you can play wrong notes, but uh, in the end, you plug in a guitar or a bass, and it works. But the drummer, it's way more physically physically demanding. And um, when we flew down to Australia, it was uh, you, you could tell it, it was an not an issue, but you could tell that uh, playing on a not your own instrument every day is, is the one thing. But on the other hand, uh, demanding travel like 27 hours something um, that uh, somehow uh, yeah you feel it the entire day. For the vocals, it's basically the same. If you, well, if you train your muscles, fine. If you're unexperienced, you it doesn't matter if you play um, in a soul band, if you if you sing in a in a death metal band, it doesn't matter. Your vocals are made with the world chords, and if you have an issue, it sounds like crap. It doesn't matter if you if you're trying to imitate Elvis or a corpse grinder from Cannibal Corpse. Uh, that doesn't matter. So I faced some issues. I remember uh, a show in Indonesia. We played in Jakarta, a big festival. We had to fly over, and I was completely um, dead, so to say. And it sounded not not too well. But on tours itself, if you keep your your discipline every day, it, of course you can have a beer, you have a, you have a drink, you can do a good party. But if you know where to stop and keep this discipline running through the entire tour, it works. You simply have to know your body. You simply have to know when to stop, where to stop, and um, how to treat yourself a little bit better. On the last tour, I played with two bands. So that means that was actually a bigger issue. Um, I played uh, in a band second out of four and with Obscura as a headliner. So that means uh, when the third band was playing every night, I had like one hour off. and. If you if you think about uh, giving everything you have and then you stop for an hour and then you start again, um, your vocal cords somehow make a pause, stop, and then until you get warm again, it's it's like playing drums for two hours and then stop an hour, or or playing playing soccer for two hours and then having one hour uh, time off and then start again. You're you're dead. So you really know uh, where where and how you, you should go partying, how, how you treat yourself and also train ahead of time. A couple of, a couple of years ago, I bought our own uh, vocal booth for my, for my living room. And before I had this uh, booth, um, the vocal performance was always like a hit and win, <laughs> yeah. lose or win. Yeah. So every second day it was a little bit different, but uh, with the vocal booth, I started to train, especially for that last tour regularly like every every second or third day i sung the entire live set of both bands so which is two hours two and a half hours with both uh sets in a row some songs i had to repeat because they didn't turn out well and that helped a lot so basically it's like sports to keep everything maintained and that helps a lot and then uh, the vocal Performance on stage also also isn't a big issue. Different when you fly in for so long, you sleep bad or you don't sleep at all. Of course, you you can hear that in the voice on stage later on. Absolutely, absolutely, man. It must be hard. Have you have you thought about um, how long you'd be able to keep it up? Like uh, I know, you know, Slayer, for instance, r- recently retired, played their last show, and I can mm. remember seeing them at a, at a festival gig. You know, in the last five years or so, and thinking, these guys are getting older now. Like, how long can they keep it up? <laughs> like, when you're seventy, can you imagine your drummer when he's seventy, doing all that shit, man? Like, 
who knows? Who knows? I mean, I, I saw Paul Bostoff uh, playing for Slayer. He still he still is pulling it off. I mean, not that much dynamic as he was back at the age of thirty, maybe, but still, still. I mean, where's a will, there's a way. I'm not sure if our drummer could play that stuff with 70 anymore, to be honest. So maybe we are going to wimp out and play some rock music later on. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> so one thing I noticed just watching one of your clips, uh, and I know this is a guitar nerd show, but just talking about the drums, was he seemed to hold the sticks really loosely. And I'm thinking that to play such intense music as you guys do, you've got to learn to get so good and comfortable at it that you can relax into it would that be a thing do you find like if you, Absolutely. Yeah, if you Absolutely. carry tension that's just not going to happen it doesn't matter if you play drums um, guitar bass or sing uh, you need a certain a certain level of technique like how how you play certain parts uh, our just uh, uh, the, the guitarist who just came back to Obscura Christian Münzner for example he um, he overplayed for many, many years. He rehearsed way too much, and it turned out um, he he got uh, what's it called? Focal dystonia. He overplayed so much that uh, he got a nerve problem. That's something you also hear from uh, from drummers in the in the extreme metal community. If you uh, dig in a little bit deeper, there are many drummers or even guitarists uh, facing focal dystonia. And um, when he got treatments by uh, like a specialist, a doctor. Uh, it turned out uh, that also many classical musicians, for example, uh, violin players, cello players, face the same issue. They overplay, and they do not have the, the right technique. They force a certain to to play a certain level um, with too much tension, and then it turned out for the worst. So they they lose basically the the ability to uh, hit the notes they want. So uh, the fingers, or um, for the drummers, often the knees are a problem because they do not uh, recognize the signals that come from the brain anymore too well. And then in the case of our guitarist, uh, he lost the ability to use his uh, ring finger completely. Wow. Like, not completely, let's say, let's say by uh, he lost like 80%. So what he had to do over the years is changing his entire way to play into double tapping. If you listen to the music uh, of uh, an album called Omnivium or the next one, you hear a lot, lot of double tapping techniques. That's only the reason because back in the days, like 15, 20 years ago, he played so much with the wrong technique that he uh, destroyed a couple of his muscle system. It's, it's in, in um, I'm not sure uh, if that is the, the right word in English. Uh, neurologic, the, the connection, neurologic yeah, between, system gets yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. I've heard yeah, of that. That's, that's a really big. Uh, I've heard and, of that. Uh, therefore, Sorry. Uh, coming back to your yeah. question, uh, 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 of course, you need to be in a in a very comfortable position with a smooth technique, and even if you hold your pick or your your drum sticks, it it may look quite a loose, but if it's just healthy but you're still hitting hard you really have a, a good amplitude doesn't matter if it's uh, holding a pick or a drumstick then you're on the right way but if you force too long to play a certain style um, that is above your level you hurt yourself it's like with sports if you try to run a marathon uh, when you're only able to run five kilometers uh, your body will get hurt <laughs> absolutely yeah. So, have you had any injuries yourself uh, from from overplaying? Mm, I had actually when I started uh, at the age of seventeen, eighteen. I really got problems with uh, how, how you call it carpal tunnel carpal tunnel syndrome or yes, yeah, carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah. I had that uh, a couple of times when I overplayed, and I figured I was simply playing wrong. Uh, I didn't have a, a proper food step. So my um, entire way how to play guitar was completely off. So the, um, it was not, it was not, um, the, the body wasn't straight. Uh, it was uh, not relaxed. It was super, um, yeah, 
it's super hard to, to play the material uh, I try to do. And of course, I also overplayed when I had the time back in the days when I was a teenager. Um, I went to school or later uh, to university and I had plenty of time. So I could play up to six, seven hours guitar a day. And if you do that the wrong way, of course, you get the carpal tunnel syndrome. I was not even able to uh, push the lights out without hurting myself. And mm. um, that's one of those points when you really need to consult uh, a proper guitar teacher. Nowadays, it's a quite it's quite easy. You have YouTube. Uh, you put in a, a couple of words to Google. Hey, uh, my hand hurts uh, playing guitar, and then you got uh, thousands of different tutorials how to do it correctly or maybe correctly. So that helped a lot. But back in the days, yes, uh, I faced the same issues. But I stopped. I stopped uh, when it started to hurt. I stopped playing guitar, and that was good. Uh -huh. um, the guitarist Christian, he didn't. He went on, he thought, ah, okay, I have to force it. I have to play this part properly. And then he rehearsed the same the same scale, uh, I don't know, 80, 80, 90 times, once again, again and again, and the day after again, and so on. And that turned out to be not the, the most smart idea. Yeah, yeah. I've had some issues myself, um, repetitive stress injuries. And um, I've just actually had... When the whole uh, lockdown thing happened, I stopped playing guitar. Mm -hmm. I just thought, because the, the gyms were all closed and everything, it's like, just give the body a break and not, yeah, let it heal because, yeah, I had some injuries going, but they seem to be good now. But that whole relaxing thing is a big thing um, when people are trying to play fast. I don't think they realize that they're, they're tensing up. And I saw, I think it was Steve I trying to teach on how he um, played guitar and that, uh, and I know it's completely different to, to what you guys, but yeah, he, when he's playing his solo stuff, he can get quite fast. And he said the key was to relax, get proficient, know exactly what you want to do, forget that you're doing it and just relax and almost listen to the speakers and just imagine the sound coming out without putting all the tension in there. So uh, it sounds like yeah, you guys have, have learned that as well to be able to pull off all this stuff. Um I yeah, to, we learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you, to play with that precision, I'm assuming you're using really heavy picks? Yeah, 1.5 millimeters I use. Yeah. And which ones? Um, uh, I use Ernieball the Prodigy, they are called. Ernieball the Prodigy? Um, I haven't seen those. I'll write that down. Um, I wasn't... Uh, I never heard from them before as well, but um, during the last years, until until I figured uh, that those the Prodigy um, picks are available, I played jazz-free picks. But um, the other guitarists I'm playing uh, along, they always told me I'm playing like a pussy <laughs> because I was not a hard hitter. Yeah. And uh, I figured uh, that the regular uh, guitar picks, they are... They, I don't like it. I, I simply don't like it. That's uh, too loose. That's not controlled enough. So I figured those uh, the Prodigy picks, they are somewhere in between in terms of size. They're also very, very sharp in the, in the very end. They are thick, uh, 1.5 millimeters. And uh, they, they look a little bit like Jazz Free, but they are a bigger. little bit bigger. Okay. A little bit bigger. That sounds yeah. like something I'd be interested and in. And within... Um, within those eight note picking we play, which is more or less the signature guitar riffing we play with uh, our uh, our sound, you you really need to hit quite hard to get a, a certain rhythmic pattern happening at the same time playing only the melody. And uh, the the prodigies that's as for now the the pick of my choice, and I wouldn't change it. Until somebody calls me playing like a pussy again. <laughs> yeah, I started using much heavier picks after meeting Andy James. I'm not sure if you've seen him on Instagram. Really? Yeah, you know Andy James? Um, yeah, I met him at NAMM show yeah. uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, uh, and he gave cool guy, me, yeah. yeah, he was. He gave me one of his new picks that were coming out, um, the Dunlop. I think they were based on the Dunlop Flows. And uh, it was... No flex in it. Prior to that, I was using one that, that flexed a little. And then I started playing with that a little and got used to it. And then when I went back to the old ones, I always tell people it felt like I was trying to write with a rubber pen. It was just 
wasn't <laughs> getting back in time to what I was trying to, to keep up with what I was trying to do. So uh, that's why I made the assum- assumption that you're using a very heavy pick. Uh, how about strings? Is there, you said you tuned down a whole step. Are you using heavier mm. strings? Or do you like not too much fight? Um, um, I change my strings depending on what I'm doing with the guitar, to be honest. So for rhythm guitars, I use thicker strings, thicker gorges, uh, simply because uh, you have less less of the movement of uh, the string. And you always have to consider the, the music we play. I need to have it as most as precise as possible. And in the studio, I use uh, thicker strings, like uh, 11 to 56 gorges. And for for uh, lead guitars, I lead uh, I like it a little bit more a little bit more smooth, especially within legato lines. Uh, I use ten to fifty six okay gorges, which is quite a use. If you play rhythm guitars with that, it's mm, might be okay, but uh, if you hit really hard, like real cor- uh, full chords, um, it sounds sometimes a little bit off for for a second. And that's what I don't like. I want to have it as most as precisely. Yeah, as uh, precisely as possible. The question is what uh, what you're doing live, and in the live sitting, I tried both ways, and I'm not really happy with both. So yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah. maybe for every solo, I have to change the guitar now, or playing double necks or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, folks, if you've got any questions uh, for for Stefan, throw them into the comments because uh, I'll start going through through some. Um, I've got one there from Ryan, the guitar pro, and he says, "How has COVID affected you or the band?" Has it been any effect? Um, yes and no. Uh, the last tour, we finished four days be- before the entire lockdown in Germany and overall Europe uh, happened. So that was good timing. Um, we haven't had to face any cancelled shows or gigs for that tour. That helped a lot since a couple of friends, they have been, for example, in the States. They had to uh, cancel their tour after one show played they are more or less ruined and a couple of other bands that already flew over to Europe and played a couple of shows run straight into their uh, in their tour and had to cancel everything like halfway through that really hurts a lot wow. so from that point we've been very lucky we had a couple of festivals planned for this year but uh, we were able to move every single one to 2021 Different story with a couple of tours that were scheduled for the end of the year. Um, we had to move those tours also to 2021. All of those tours haven't been announced yet, so we didn't lose any money. But at the same time, we do not have any income in 2020. Mm. Well, if you if you're running a proper band these days, you and you, you decide to keep it going, you definitely need uh, well. Uh, iron bollocks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not giving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to speak uh, straight about that. Um, the situation is not ideal. Um, in Europe, most of the most of the venues are somehow connected to the government, so you get uh, well, you you get helped in in some way. When I look into the United States, I'm not sure how it is in Australia, but in the United States, most of the venues are made by made by the owners. They are, they are kept keeping running by the owners itself. It's nothing uh, connected to the government. If they don't have any income, they are done within two months. And uh, I really fear that uh, this entire COVID problematic uh, epidemic may cause uh, the loss of probably half of the venues we are used to play in the States. And it takes so much effort. It takes so much work and also money, of course, uh, finances to build up a venue like that. At the same time, all of the promoters who are not owning a venue but uh, make a living of promoting shows, um, all the booking agents, then the entire live scene is, is affected heavily. Over here, my... Um, my beloved club called Backstage in Munich, which is one of the bigger venues with uh, three areas, a big room, a middle room, a small room. They need half a million euros just to 
to keep running the costs for uh, three months. Wow. And if you don't have shows, you, you of course you have you have um, you have to pay all of your all of your invoices, all of your fees, everything uh, you have to pay. But at the same time, there's zero income, and I'm not sure what is going to happen. Also, 2021, everybody who is not playing a show this year is moving their shows to next year, and it will pile up. Everybody tries to make up the money they they lost uh, this year over next year. Or so. I'm not sure where this is going to. Mm. At the moment, we are here. We're using uh, the time to write a new record. The problem is everybody else does as well. So next year, you have a pile-up uh, touring schedule of every artist, but at the same time, um, everybody will release new music also at the same time. And I fear most of the small and mid-sized bands, they will suffer from that heavily. The big, The big players like Guns N' Roses, Metallica, whatever they named, they still play their stadium shows and they will all be sold out. Mm-hmm. They, uh, I mean, they're, they're in a quite comfortable zone, so to speak. But everything abo- uh, below that level, different story. Think about um, um, a tour in Australia. When a band from Europe, like, like us, will fly down to Australia, it's... First of all, very, very expensive to fly down. You have to connect it with, for example, New Zealand, play a couple of shows in the Middle East or, or uh, Japan, South Korea. But if um, the situation like right now is going to be continued over the next year and uh, international traveling means like um, I'm flying to Australia, go then to, a, um, let's call it Japan and have to stay there two weeks in quarantine. Uh, touring won't be happen mm. the same ways. So either there will be no shows or very expensive shows, and at the same time the artists barely make any money or even have to invest money just to go on stage again. Mm. So it's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell what is going to happen. I'm a quite positive person, so I really hope things go up to the better, and there uh, might be an injection or something to to avoid. Uh, uh, a second outbreak or a second wave, as everybody calls it. We simply have to stay positive. But at the moment, everything, everything we can do is stay at home, have a good time with our gear, buy new gear, <laughs> 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 test out the gear, yeah. and uh, enjoy enjoy writing music. That's that's everything we can do. So in Australia, we were given the opportunity to withdraw what we call our superannuation fund, our, our retirement fund. Uh, and looking at the music stores, everyone's so busy because everybody's using that to buy new guitars. And I, I spoke to a guitar builder today, ah. Charles Cilia, and he said he's never been busier. Uh, and, well, I'm actually talking to you right now on a new MacBook that I got because I really needed one, um, uh, and which I, I did use my super money for. I, I got some more questions there for you, Stefan. Um, what have we got? This is COVID. Practice routines. Do you have a practice routine, and do you feel his technique and speed suffers if you don't play regularly? Absolutely. I do have a practice routine. I try to keep it up uh, to two hours a day, which means I'm warming up half an hour uh, to a metronome. Wait a second. This here is my tiny little metronome I work with since I'm nine years old. Wow. It's a really analog uh, it's like a, a caveman micro uh, uh, caveman piece, but it works perfectly. And uh, I have a couple of uh, different uh, routines. I play with the uh, with the metronome every day, uh, half an hour. Then I start to play songs from the band, and afterwards I'm into songwriting. I do not play too much guitar. It's always a back and forth with writing music and record a couple of riffs. But um, that's my my daily routine. Unfortunately, I do not play any any other music. That's something I'm I'm regretting since since years. Because if you play music you didn't write yourself, it opens your focus and shifts uh, your palette a little bit to the better. I never played a jazz standard. I never played. Uh, rock songs. I never played covers like that. I only played what I do. And 
this is a little bit sad and uh, I would love to uh, spice up my, my daily routine with that. For example, playing any other song once a week. And uh, I think about doing that for the last 10 years, but I didn't do it up today. <laughs> okay. I've got another question here. Who your biggest? Who is your biggest idol? Is it Chuck Chuck Schneider? It's all written really s small here. I can barely read it. I don't know if I can read those names. Chuck Schuldiner. That. Schuldiner. That's it. Muhammad Shumesh. Yes, or Hetfield. Yeah. So you know these people. So who's who is your biggest idol? Uh, when I, when I started playing guitar. And uh, as a teenager, I was into this entire death metal scene. We started with uh, Death and Chuck Schuldiner, uh, as well as Pestilence, Cynic, uh, Atheist, all those, all those uh, I call it uh, classic technical or progressive death metal bands. All those bands uh, had their, yeah, their years somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s, until mid 90s. And when I started to play guitar, I, I loved and uh, idolized all of those bands, obviously. And Chuck Schuldiner, Chuck Schuldiner was more or less the, the reason why I played guitar or started to play guitar. But um, these days, um, I do not have any idol. What I really try to do and I'm working on since many years is building my own, my own palette, my, my, my own sound. I do not want to copy anyone. And... Uh, Obviously, I have to say, um, Chuck Schuldiner, Mohamed Schumesh, Necrophagist, and also James Hetfield, they have been a huge, huge influence when I started to play guitar. But for every musician, there is somewhere the point where you simply want to go your own way and build up your own sound, build uh, your own signature riffing, whatever it is. Uh, in my place, also vocals. Uh, there are influences, but I'm not idolizing anyone anymore. But of course, I love the work of all the three guys. And yesterday I listened, funny enough, Metallica, Necrophagist, and Death. So cool. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Wow. So, so yeah, that, that was a good good question. Then Ryan, you, you must have you must have picked up on the uh, on what you were listening. Um, how did the return of Christian happen? Um. Christian Minchin is the guitarist I mentioned before with uh, the vocal Estonia. Yep. And uh, Christian left the band many years ago, 2014, I think. And he already recorded two records with the band. When he left, uh, he had to leave because of his vocal Estonia. And we also had some disagreements in which musically direction we're going to do, uh, going to go with the band. But um, earlier this year, after the, the European tour, we finished before this entire COVID lockdown started. Um, the other three guys in the band left because they wanted to go into a way more technical and way more progressive direction, but I didn't. With Christian, I stayed in touch uh, since he left the band. And uh, he was the first person I, I reached out to, and within a couple of days, it was quite easy uh, to say that he was back in the band. Since... He's a guitarist, you know the band. He already added his sound to two records, and there's no reason why I shouldn't ask him again. He's a killer person. He's a killer guitarist, and uh, as a character, simply easy to hang out with. That Playing is, in, that is band, such an important thing, isn't it? You've just got to be a good dude to hang out with, man. No one wants to hang out with a fuckwit. That's, just... <laughs> uh, that's really nice said. The point is what, what I figured out uh, in playing bands over, over the years is exactly what you just mentioned. Um, when we started uh, with the band, uh, we have been a couple of friends, a couple of um, guys visiting the same school. But as soon as you transform from uh, having a, like a band project, recording music uh, in a studio, putting out CDs and playing a live show here and then into a real touring band, where you stick into a, a small tour bus for six weeks, eight weeks sometimes, you really have to get along very well. And if you're in such a small space for such a long time, you know and uh, get to know every, every tiny little detail of each one's character. And if you're not getting along with, and if you're on top, don't like touring at all, circumstances, they are not too well. 
often, mm. but you ha don't have to care. When you're on stage, you have to deliver the best show you can offer. If you're sick, it doesn't matter. If you had food poisoning, if, you, if you're not feeling well, fuck it. You have to go on. The show must go on. It's a, it's a golden rule. And if you're not made for this, this kind of lifestyle, it is in the end a lifestyle. If you play free tours and a couple of festivals uh, in a year, plus doing trips to Australia, to Japan, to South America, and then you really, really, really need to get along very well. Mm. And speaking of now, I think getting along with your bandmates is more important than uh, having the best musician on the planet. Absolutely. I had to do, yeah, I had to do with so many musicians that are playing circles around me or other people. Yep. But you cannot get along with them. Then you don't want to spend time with them. And then the entire mood in, in a band goes downwards. Mm -hmm. And... Coming back to the question, Christian is both a killer musician, great character. That's the reason why he's back in a band. Uh -huh. The next question <laughs> from Matthew was, uh, and I think you um, covered it, was why did Raphael, Raphael and Linus leave? I, I'm assuming they're the guys that left when you said that you got Christian back. So you, you, you did mention there was a bit of a difference in uh, musical direction there. What is your favorite song on... Delivium, is that how you say that? It's it's really small down uh, there. Is that the name of the album? Uh, um, it's hard to say. I like uh, each and every song on the album. But uh, since the album is very diverse, it depends on your mood. We have very, very, very technically demanding uh, songs on the record. Like the title track is super, super uh, demanding. When it comes to polyrhythms, it's, uh, I think, the pinnacle of, of what we did. On the other hand, this is not a very cheesy song. If you just want to listen to music alongside, for example, working in your office, maybe this get on your nerves quite fast. There are a couple of headbang songs uh, on the record. It's hard to choose. It's really hard to choose. Every, uh, every song on each record um, has a reason why it is on the record, and we didn't skip it. So I really have a hard time picking one song I really like and uh, I don't like. That changes daily. Okay. As of now, I would say um, Clandestine Stars, the opener, and uh, the second uh, song, Emergent Evolution. As for today, those are my, my favorite songs. Maybe tomorrow I change my mind. When the mood changes. <laughs> okay. Another question yes, from Matthew as well is, and I hope I can say these words right, who wrote and composed Septuagint? So no, Septuagint and... Septuagint. Yes, and Avium. Those are absolute masterpieces. They just wanted to know oh, who wrote fun. those. It's a, uh, both songs are on an album called Omnivium from 2011. Quite an old record already. And uh, the first song, Sepburgind, was, uh, was written by Free Guys. Um, it was first... Actually, in, in Septuagint, we put together two songs. One song was written by myself. One song was uh, written by Christian Münzner. And uh, we simply put both songs together to one piece. That's the reason why the song is uh, around seven or eight minutes long. And our drummer added uh, uh, the intro and I think uh, a bridge or something. So it, it's a collective work. The song Evum was written entirely by our drummer. But it's all it's all in the in the credits in the in the vinyl or CD version whatever you have at home. Wow, wow. I uh, I was just thinking to myself. Um, you said that you were using Guitar Pro to do all the demos, and that was kind of cheesy and MIDI sounds. Have you ever thought mm. of releasing like a elevator music style <laughs> one of those demos? Get that out there and see what people think, because that would sound. I can just imagine that intense music. How that would sound. Um, on those demos, ah. what, what do what do your friends say when they hear those? That sounds like Super Mario from the eighties. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, our our drummer, for example, he released one of those songs um, from uh, Guitar Pro. Yep. Um, on one of his records, I don't uh, remember when. Uh, and which one, but uh, I know that he, he used one of those Guitar Pro lines uh, and simply put a piano over it. Oh, really? He cut the drums 
and he just put a piano over it and it sounds uh, quite reasonable it's quite quite doable to be honest it doesn't sound bad at all so you could release this music it doesn't matter if you if you play it with a guitar or a piano or some something else uh, if you just export um, those those melodies and lines then you figure it's uh, real music it's not only noise <laughs> wow, wow but uh, I, that answers your question so it, it it could work under that circumstances as well okay yeah i was i was thinking it'd be really interesting to hear those uh, but as you say it, it it does work huh um who would you love to play with is there any musicians you mentioned some of the, the guys you really idolize who's out there that you would like to play with Ooh, that's a good question um that's a very good question i didn't think of um i would really love to jam along dave Grohl. cool that would be fun uh, one of my favorite drummers ever and uh, the guys in gojira are killer that would be fun and meshuga i love meshuga from sweden that's a super super heavy band cool aside aside that i think the, everything else is not realistic Talking about Metallica or Megadeth, <laughs> that would be fun. Well, you never know. You never. You got to think big. That's what I tell people. You got to think big because who knows, man? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I really would like to know how um, Dave Mustaine and uh, James Hatfield are approaching to playing playing guitar. Maybe back in the days, or and uh, compared to to right now, because uh, if you listen to all those. Those old records from the, let's call it 80s and early 90s, you have to think that editing like these days was not possible. Mm. And all, I'm not talking about solo guitar lines or, or leads. I'm really talking only about uh, the, the rhythm guitars because they are super, super tight. I would really like to nerd about this a little bit, how, how they recorded everything and uh, how, <clears throat> how many layers they recorded because... The, the sound is really, really unique on all of those records. That would be quite interesting. These days, you can um, you can load all different sounds uh, through the impulse responses uh, and modeling amps around. But back in the days, you defined your sound uh, through equipment, through the, even the mixing desks had their, their own sound, uh, through uh, cables, through microphones, through the positions of the microphones. There, there were so many weird ideas how to how to uh, produce a certain guitar sound and it would be really interesting to t talk about those two guitars but also to the producers back in the days who came up with the ideas there there was always somewhere the guy who made this sound happening for example uh, if you if you know studio friedman in sweden they had a very unique approach how to um place the microphones on a certain spot, the, the sweet spot on the guitar cabinet. And I think he was the first guy who somehow nerded around that or even even just uh, figured it out by try and try and error or, or something. But uh, somehow this this creative idea to get a certain guitar sound, that's, that's something I'm really interested in. Well, I wouldn't discount not ever meeting those guys and asking them yourself man like who knows you you could play a festival gig one day and you're hanging out the back and who comes and sits beside you but james hatfield man stranger shit happens you know i wouldn't complain about that yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> so uh ryan wants to know what gear are you using in your home studio you said cubase and rme oh he's he's asking are you using cubase and rme like a good German boy. <laughs> <laughs> I use Cubase, obviously, um, but I use a Motu uh, audio interface. Okay, I think I think uh, Ryan might actually be German. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, Cause I, <laughs> Ryan, because I know that you went over there recently, so that's probably why you, you dropped that that term there. So yeah, you said Cubase and um, what was the uh, and what uh, Motu Motu and O T O. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, cool. I haven't seen those around in a little while. Uh, they're quite common over here. Are they? In uh, Central Europe, like every uh, every radio station, or let's call it every second radio station or TV, 
uh, studio they use them. It's solid. It's solid. It's uh, there. There's no color in the sound. It's quite linear, as far as possible. Cool. Cool. Uh, it says here you mentioned Guitar Pro and it and its pros and cons. It's such a great tool for his generation to have made metal super technical. How will the next generation mm -hmm. up the level again? Who knows? Uh, as long as they keep playing guitar, as long as the next generation keeps playing guitar. Yeah. Um, in the last in the last years, there, there's always uh, a movement going in the exactly opposite. Um, there, there are many, many... Um, I call them 70s sounding bands. Um, for example, Ghost, uh, Lucifer, um, Secrets of the Moon. They go back to having uh, less gear and less equipment uh, than before. So uh, having the approach to getting a mo the, the most pure and most organic and most unique sound, which is quite cool. I mean, there's no right or wrong. It's It's all... A matter of taste how you how you approach your music and what you want to do there might be a, even a program that is um, something like melodyne for guitars in a live setting that there are no mistakes possible anymore oh, no. in the future who knows i hope not ah uh, uh, who knows <laughs> who knows who knows it's always it always depends on, on on the generation and how they how they want to play music i have to admit Playing with Guitar Pro, um, making music with Guitar Pro, uh, recording all those demos, all those pre-productions, and getting into this nerd corner of the music is a complete opposite of what we did in the beginning. In, in the beginning, we've been just friends, meeting once or twice a week in a rehearsal room and started playing. You just plug in and play, literally. And uh, nowadays, you, you call this like a, ro a romantic idea of rehearsal spots <laughs> <laughs> and bo both ways work both ways work it doesn't matter if you're playing roaster tour or in dream theater if you like what you're doing do it if you don't like what you're doing change it so speaking of, of rehearsal rooms i know that's where i did a lot of the damage to my ears in my younger days because yeah we'd be rehearsing four nights a week and be sitting in this tiny little room with the drummer cymbal right here How's your hearing? Have have you had any damage to your your hearing over the years? Um, not really. No. I always had. Uh, I had some years where I tried to play drums, and I didn't use uh, proper uh, proper ear. How you call it? Ear, ear plugs. plugs. Yep. Yeah, that was uh, not very smart. Um, but aside from that, I always uh, I figured that. The more controlled the sound on stage and in the rehearsal room is, the the better each instrument is uh, audible. Mm. That turned into from being 16, 17 to cranking up everything, as I mentioned in the beginning, into lower the the volumes day by day. So and nowadays we are um, rehearsing either only through in ears. So with the cap loader, I don't uh, rehearse with any any cabinets anymore. So that's also way faster and more, we are German efficient. Uh, <laughs> when building up your, <laughs> uh, when building up your your practice uh, space and all the gear. But um, I worked for many years uh, in the department acoustics for BMW, for Rolls Royce. Uh, I did, uh, yeah, a couple of different jobs in this engineering department. And uh, building up studios, building up uh, audio studios, radio studios, rehearsal studios, and um, yeah, wh what I uh, I need the most for my jobs is my hearing. So I spent a lot of money for um, really good in-ear earplugs, yeah. but also for avoiding no noise everywhere. Yeah. Where I'm also listening listening to music. No, uh, when you, when you're mixing music, for example. Uh, there, there's that uh, golden rule. You have to mix at uh, 85 dB. If you do that for longer than two hours, in my opinion, you may adjust uh, to to the standards, but at the same time, at the same time, your your hearing really gets, um, yeah, used a little bit too much than it should be. 
when I'm uh, rehearsing at my uh, vocal booth here, the, the backing tracks are really lowered uh, when I'm uh, rehearsing guitar at home uh, with my tube amplifiers. Uh, I don't crank it up, not only because of the neighbors, but also simply because I don't like it. I'm, I'm trying to get the most precise sound possible, but that doesn't mean it has to be equal with loudness. Sure, sure. Have, has anybody ever rang the police thinking there's somebody being murdered in your house when you're practicing vocals? Not yet. That's why I bought a, a vocal. <laughs> But uh, when we recorded uh, vocals a couple of years ago for one of the albums, um, there was the housekeeper coming and asking what the fuck is going on here at two, 2 in the morning. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> because... I, I hear everything uh, with the backing tracks, but he's only hearing like a guy screaming over being killed right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <I> <laughs> uh, got a couple more questions here before I round things up, Stefan. Um, uh, let me see. What do you think of animals as leaders and have you played an Abasi guitar? I never played with uh, one of his guitars. I think he moved from Ibanez to building his own guitars yeah, some, yeah. some time ago. Yep. And uh, we met a couple of times. Uh, we played a couple of shows together, a couple of fe uh, festivals years ago. And on NEM show 2018, we also uh, talked a little bit. Um, I think they, they brought also, I, first of all, uh, I think we have the same root of music. But they brought it into a little bit more fusion-esque uh, direction. Uh, it grooves a lot. What I really like about the band is that they they make their very own sound. As far as I know, they do not have any bass guitars. They only have two eight-string guitarists mm. and a very groove-oriented approach. But in the end, it's it's very, very heavy music. But I like that they have established their own palette of, of sounds and it seems like they're, they're quite successful with what they're doing, which means in return, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're if you having a weird setup or a weird sound. Uh, if you do what you like and you really push it, you can be successful even with a quite weird setup. This is, this is cool. That, that's what our music is about. You do your own stuff from the heart. You do what you like and then... Even the, the most bizarre music can be successful. That's cool. And um, Animals as Leaders is not music I listen to every day. It doesn't fit or uh, it's, uh, it's not my taste 100%, but I absolutely respect the band for what they're doing. And uh, as I mentioned, I understand the approach. And this is, this is killer. Cool band. Cool, cool. I, I saw them a couple of years ago, actually, uh, in Brisbane here. Uh, with one of the guys that was in the, in the chat here. I'm not sure if he's still here, Link. And um, Pliny was on before him. Have you heard Pliny, the Australian guy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, great show, great show. Uh, now, another question yep. here. Do you consider yourself a gear freak? And what's your opinion on Thomas Blug's Amp One line as a pro touring guitarist? Um. I wouldn't call myself a gear freak. I'm not a guitar hoarder, for example. I only have um, two electric guitars per band. So which means I, I, at the moment I own six electric guitars. Um, two six strings for Obscura, two seven strings for Obscura, two six strings for Vulcandra. And that's it. I don't need any more guitars. I will work on a, a certain custom guitar at the moment but that's it in terms of gear i know what i want but i'm still trying to optimize things that's what i mentioned uh, i know exactly what sound i want to have or i even found it with uh, the amplifiers i do have but wherever i can find a spot to make things a little bit more smooth while in the studio or being on stage with for example avoiding the microphone settings every day then I try to to work on that for a very long time. But I'm not trying out every new equipment that's on the market. I like to visit uh, the NEM show or in uh, Germany there's a new um, there's a new expo called um, Guitar Summit, which seems to grow up a lot, or Frankfurt Musikmesse. 
and all that. That's that's quite interesting. Simply to see what's what's going on here and there, and sometimes you you get the impression that this or that unit might might be helpful. But I'm, I'm using tube amplifiers for my entire life, and I'm going to stick for that. At the same time, I'm trying out a couple of modeling apps, but not everything. But not everything. Sure. I stick to ESP guitars for a couple of years, but I don't need to own 20 guitars from other manufacturers because I love the gear I have. Otherwise, I would sell it. <laughs> so the second part of that question there was, have, have um, do you have an opinion on Thomas Blug's Amp 1 uh, as a pro touring guitarist? Have you, have you tried the Amp 1? Exactly. Um not. <laughs> no, I actually, no, I know Thomas. I, I know Thomas, and I think it's a fantastic unit, and I want to get one myself just for, for small shows where I could not be bothered taking you know, a big amp along with me because um, I, I do play some small shows filling in in cover bands around the place as well, uh, and I'd like to get one of those for, for those kinds of gigs. But I'm, I'm with you. I love a tube amp. If I've got to play a big show, there's nothing like feeling that when they – they just compress in a certain way and it's the transformers, the tubes, everything, you know, just when you get to a certain volume that just makes you play better, huh? Yeah, it's, well, again, there's there's no right or wrong, but uh, I can see your point. The convenient part of having a small unit, um, playing small shows or even flying shows. We have a couple of festivals or um, tours where we have to fly a lot and bringing your entire tube rig with you might be difficult and also fragile. Think about the tubes being shaked in, a, in an airplane. How about when you came to so, Australia? Did you bring your own backline when you came to Australia? Um, yes and no. Uh, I do have a, a fly-in part of uh, our backline. So what I did is uh, bringing along the cap loader. I brought uh, the small preamp. The angle preamp, which is uh, all in all, it uh, it has the same weight uh, or it uh, takes the same space as, for example, a fractal uh, FX or uh, a camper or something like that. I, I'm I'm still trying around. Sometimes we uh, rent uh, gear wherever we play tours. For example, in the United States, I of course rent an entire backline and just fly over what I need. But I try to get away from um, using any modeling amps. So, but if if a thing sounds good and it works fine, of course you can you can try it out. For myself, I I bought a, a used uh, F, uh, XFX. I think from the second second version XFX two or something it was called. Simply um, to make some A/B tests with my gear and. I tried it. I also tried uh, the XFX for some shows, but I have to admit, I don't like it. I even it's it's simply not my taste. I I wouldn't blame people who are who are playing with this gear because it's their taste, but it doesn't represent my sound. Mm -hmm. That's quite political correct, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I have I've had all the different modelers, man. I've had a Kemper. I've had XFX. I, th I think it was an XFX. AX8 was the last one I had of those. Uh, I've had Helix. Okay, so a classic example. One of the bands I play with, um, probably the more metal band that I play with, King Mungie. Uh I went to a rehearsal and I used the Axe Effects AX8 into a tube power amp. Uh, the Fryette power station right behind me there. Uh, into a couple of cabs. And the other guitar player had a, uh, a Mesa dual rectifier and his sound just absolutely shat all over mine. It just made it sound absolutely stupid. Then I got a Friedman small box and then I went to rehearsals and I feel really bad because I then made his sound sound really stupid. It was just so fucking good in comparison. So yeah, I went from, okay, the, 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 the Mesa was the benchmark, no, the, the modeler didn't cut it and then when I got the other tube amp it was like oh I've just upped that one once again <laughs> um, yeah I, I really want to try some more more angle gear out there's, there's not much of it in Australia here and and that's um, that's something I'd like to see more of over here um, I do know of a angle Richie Blackmore had 
going pretty cheap in a music store that I might make a silly offer on and see if I can get that because uh, I would like ah. I would like to get some some angle uh, angle tube goodness into my life. The fantastic amps when I played them <laughs> when I was over there. There's one more question there, uh, folks. If you've got any more questions, now's the time to to shoot them before I round things up with Stefan. But uh, Matthew wants to know when are you coming to South Africa? And I guess the short answer is not until COVID's over. But uh, have you got any plans to go to South Africa? Uh, actually, we already were very, very close to play a festival in South Africa, and it's still on the bucket list. Um, I love traveling. I love to uh, play places where we haven't played before, like uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, last year. And South Africa, I think um, the festival didn't happen in the end. We were confirmed for that one. The festival didn't happen since, I think, the, the currency fell down. Or fell apart, something like that. So the the promoter couldn't afford any bands that have been paid in either US dollar or euro. It was not sketchy, but uh, it seems uh, the economy down there turned for the worse for mm-hmm. some years. And what I'm talking about, that was uh, around six, seven years ago already. Okay. So I'm not sure I've, if I ever get the chance to play South Africa, Africa, I would do it. Cool. We never played in Africa yet overall, so that's still yeah, it's a big continent, so nice, nice. <laughs> we have to. Now the battery just ran out on my little camera up there, so I don't you guys are gonna have to bear with me as I cut to that shot and watch this. I, through the magic of television I can do that and do that and then we're back. I'm using my MacBook now, which I just angle to get that. Oh look at that. Emergency backup plan. Because of this whole COVID thing, you can't get anything out of China and there's no battery packs available for the actual camera that I'm using, uh, and that makes it a bit awkward. I, halfway to most interviews, I have to change that, but I got to right up to the end here by the sounds of things. Uh, so, okay, I was just seeing if there's any more questions. There's a thanks, Rick and Stefan. That was fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. Stefan, thank you, man. Anything else? I want to ask you, um, where can people buy and listen to your music? To Obscura? Uh, easiest way, simply visit our website, realmofobscura.com. Um, find us on Facebook, Instagram. All those social media channels are well feeded with all our music. Awesome. Awesome. And as I said, man, I, I really um, I really got to thank Jürgen for introducing me to you because uh, I wasn't expecting that. I, I, not Progressive death metal is not something I would normally have listened to. But since discovering you guys, it's like, hell yeah, this stuff is cool. <laughs> so I think you've just picked up a new fan, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much for the interview. And it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. So, folks, um, please like, subscribe, all that kind of thing. If you haven't checked out any of my other interviews, um, I'm lining up some pretty cool cool people. So um, And very diverse, you know, people like, like Stefan here. I've had uh, people like... Louis Shelton, who's the old Motown uh, great. Um, I've got people like, ooh, who's coming next week? You'll have to go to my website and have a look. I've put a couple of them up, and I'm about to put up a few more uh, as we finish this. But once again, Stefan, thank you so much, man. I'm going to hit my magic button. You know what happens when I hit the magic button? My end screen comes up, and it goes something like this. <laughs>